Okay, so the topic of this video will be the origins of life. So let's go ahead and get started. Well, let's go ahead and begin with the nebula hypothesis. Now, first of all, what's a nebula? Well, it's a cloud of gas and dust in space. Now, when we say a cloud of gas, the gases we're looking at are like hydrogens and helium gases that will eventually ignite stars. And uh, nebulas are kind of given these poetic little nicknames, the birthplace of stars or a stellar nursery. And because this is where stars and solar systems and planets form out of are, are the gases of a nebula. Here's a few pictures of some nebula that I found that I just think are kind of pretty. You might have to use your imagination a little bit. For instance, the Crab Nebula or the Eskimo Nebula or the Hourglass Nebula. One of my favorites right here is the Eagle Nebula. If you turn it, maybe you kind of see the eagle shape a little bit. If not, what if I did this? Put a little picture of an eagle there and take away the eagle. Does that help? Well, hopefully you can see why it's called the Eagle Nebula. And then one of my favorites, the Horsehead Nebula. But these nebula all have something in common. They're filled with hydrogen gases and helium gases and eventually stars and solar systems and planets will form out of these gases. And so that's what the nebula hypothesis explains. Uh, that gravity, here's our crab nebula again, but gravity will start to pull the gases inward. The hydrogen gases, the helium gases, pull the gases inward and eventually a star ignites. And so here we have, you know, a star, a sun. And then the uh, kind of the remaining materials kind of forms planets. And in our solar system here, you might know the four innermost planets are the rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. These are the terrestrial planets. They actually have surfaces that you could walk upon. But the outer planets are kind of nicknamed the gas giants. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they're, they're gases. They're, there's no surface that we could land upon and explore if we had the technology to do that. Well, when it comes to Earth, we can say that the Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. And, and we know that from the radiometric dating of rocks and meteors that have landed on, on Earth. So by examining the decay rate of isotopes in rocks, we come to 4.6 billion years old. Kind of a fun little side note here. Uh, it's estimated that around 4 billion years ago, BYA in the picture means a billion years ago, uh, the moon formed when young ancient primitive Earth was struck by a, struck by a planet-sized body and uh, that collision resulted in the formation of our moon. So it's kind of an interesting little side note there. Well, let's go ahead and talk about ancient Earth. First of all, the Hadean era or the Hadean Eon, 4.6 to 4 billion years ago. Well, let's look at the climate here. Uh, incredibly, incredibly hot, very different than today for a couple reasons. Why was the Earth a thought to, if you imagine this artist's impression of the Hadean era, why do we think it looked like this? Well, uh, number one, the Earth was constantly being uh, impacted by objects from space. Early in the formation of the solar system, there's just a lot more meteors and comets drifting around in space. So collisions were a lot more fre frequent than they are today. Not only that, but from the evidence that we find in really ancient rocks, we, are, we see that the Earth itself was a lot more volcanically active than, uh, than currently today. And so for these reasons, ancient Earth, we believe, had a very, very hot climate. Way too hot to support any life. Uh, when, we, uh, when we examine rocks, ancient rocks, we can kind of get a good idea of what the atmosphere may have contained. For instance, it's believed that there is a lot of ammonia, water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide gases in the ancient atmosphere. And where did these gases come from? Well, many of the gases came from, for instance, volcanoes. Even volcanoes today are spewing out lots of these particular gases here. And uh, another place that, that water can come from was, is uh, when comets 
crash onto Earth. You know, a comet is just a, basically a big frozen block of ice. And so when it crashes, it brings water. Now, did all of the water on Earth come from comet impacts? No. A lot of the water came from volcanic uh, gases, that, like you see in this picture here, steam being released in, uh, in, from this particular volcano here. Well, one thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, as crucial as life is, or as crucial as oxygen is to life. Well, this was at a time when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Well, you think about oxygen. It's a byproduct of photosynthesis. Things that do photosynthesis would be like cyanobacteria and algae and, of course, plants. But these organisms did not exist yet. So if there's no life, there's no photosynthetic life, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. It's kind of an interesting little side note there. Well, eventually, our ancient Earth begins to cool off. And one of the reasons for the cooling is Earth is less and less, becoming less and less and less impacted by objects from space. And the sun is one of the big reasons for that. The sun, I'm sure you know, is a lot more massive and has a stronger gravitational pull than the Earth. And so the sun has been gobbling up asteroids and meteorites and, and other debris that's been drifting around in the solar system for billions of years. So there's just less impacting the Earth as more time passes. Uh, kind of a side note here, in 1994, this was a kind of a big science story here. The Shoemaker-Levy comet um, was swallowed up by Jupiter. Uh, again, some of the gas planets have been, uh, have been impacted as well. And in 1994, we saw the Shoemaker-Levy comet be absorbed and swallowed up by Jupiter. And as it got closer and closer, it breaks into these fragments. And it was really, really interesting. So if you do a quick Google search, on the Shoemaker-Levy uh, comet, you'll see some really interesting pictures as uh, these, uh, as these, uh, the comet collided repeatedly, uh, the 21 fragments into Jupiter. It's kind of a fun little story to read about. Well, another reason why the Earth eventually starts to cool down is Earth is not nearly as volcanically active. As time passes, the volcanic activity slows. And so the Earth is less volcanically active less impacted by objects from space, and so the atmosphere and the planet begin to cool down. Well, if I were to ask you, clouds are a sign of which step of the water cycle? I hope you would say condensation, the process where water changes from a gas to a liquid, because as Earth begins to cool, we knew that there was a lot of water gas, water vapor in the sky, but it's too hot for it to condense and fall as a liquid. But as the Earth begins to cool, condensation happens. And so the water vapor condenses. All the vapor in the sky begins to condense. And eventually, as it cools, starts to fall as rain. Now, this happened over the course of millions of years, of course. No one's implying that it rained, you know, in one night. But eventually, our oceans were formed as the water vapor in the sky condensed and started to fall as liquid rain. Well, let's uh, shift focus here, and let's talk about Miller and Urey. Harold Urey, Stanley Miller, two scientists from the 1950s at the University of Chicago, they performed a really, really interesting, kind of a groundbreaking experiment. So let's look at their experimental setup that they performed here. They had a gas chamber, and inside they filled it with gases that they believed were found in the atmosphere of ancient Earth billions upon billions of years ago. So NH3, H2O, CH4, H2, these are gases that they inserted into the gas chamber. Now, why? Uh, what are these gases? Well, the NH3 is ammonia. The H2O is simply water vapor. The CH4 is methane and the H2 is hydrogen gas. Now, these gases were thought to be in the atmosphere of ancient Earth billions upon billions of years ago. And then, you can see in the animation, they added an electrical spark to simulate lightning, an energy source that was available on Earth at this time. And watch what happens. 
because of the energy from the lightning, from the electrical sparks, the molecules of ammonia and water vapor and methane and hydrogen, they're all broken apart. Now what happens next is where it gets hopefully really interesting. In the right hand side, the lower right hand side, there's a little uh, chamber where a slimy film begins to appear after a day or so. And they start to chemically analyze what is the slimy film that's starting to appear on the inside of that little container there. And if I were to put this, uh, this diagram up here and give you a moment to look at it, and I hope you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, there's an NH2 on the left, that's an amino group. There's a COOH on the right, that's a carboxyl group. Oh, that's an amino acid. So uh, upon examination, they were able to, uh, to produce building blocks of life. Amino acids, I think you should know, are the building blocks of proteins. And nucleotides, which I hope you know are the building blocks of nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA. Now let me ask, did they produce life? Did they produce living organisms out of the gases of ancient Earth? And the answer is absolutely no, not at all. However, it's really interesting to think about what this might imply. So what this, uh, what this really shows is, number one, that organic molecules, amino acids, nucleotides, proteins, nucleic acids, these are organic molecules. Organic molecules could form from the ancient atmosphere. And not only that, but quite possibly that this could have been an early step that eventually led to the formation of life on Earth today. And so that's kind of a, uh, a little rundown here of the Miller and Urey experiment. Okay, so as we wrap up this video right here, if you're in my biology class, try to answer these questions on a separate sheet of paper, and I'm happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. Thanks for watching.